Okay, yeah, I'll let everyone comes in. Hello, welcome to the National Engineering Month and McMaster ITE uh, NEM challenge for this month. Um, I think we're gonna give a few more minutes for more people to come in, but we hope that this is something that is interesting and compelling for all of you. Um, so we have quite uh, the tutorial that's going to be led by our very own Jonathan Tsuku coming up, and then a challenge for everyone to complete throughout the day. Yeah, we'll just give it, give it a few more minutes. Okay, so I think we'll at least get started with um, introductions. Um, so to get started, I will introduce uh, the ITE team here. Uh, we have today, we are from McMaster University. We are part of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Uh, we're the student chapter here at McMaster. And what we focus on is kind of connecting, especially the student body with the professional engineering community in Ontario through uh, different events. Recently, we have switched predominantly back to in-person events, but we are back online for this one uh, to make sure people can access it from anywhere in Ontario. Uh, I am Joseph D'Angelo, one of the co-presidents for this year, um, and joining me to help plan this event and do so, so much work for it is Jonathan Suku, our other co-president for this year, Olivia Wiper, our VP of Media and Marketing, and uh, Deo, our VP of Administration. So uh, big thanks to them for helping make this day possible, as well as Naslina Khan from the OPSE and NEM for helping do all the work on their side to make this event possible. But yeah, um, I will leave it for Jonathan to get started. For sure. Uh, yes. Um, just to make sure, uh, you guys can hear me clearly, right? Okay. Cool. Cool. Um. So yeah, as my uh, fellow co-president Joseph Joseph said, we are from McMaster University, the ITE student chapter. We just provided our um, Instagram and our Linktree link, so you can get to know a little bit more about us and what we do at McMaster University. More or less, uh, our goal is, to, I guess. Um, connect uh, students um, with uh, industry experts and professionals and get an idea of um, the many, many things going on in transportation uh, engineering. Um, in terms of uh, our agenda for today, um, in this first, um, in this hour here between now and 11, we have our introduction to the competition and um, what what the challenge exactly is about and what, what the expectations and deliverables are. And then once we go through that, we'll give a short and brief um, tutorial on uh, QGIS and open GIS software and some of the more basic functions of it. Following that between now um, and seven uh, 6.59 p.m. Uh, tonight is, I guess, the open project time. Um, our host, um, we will be available via Zoom if there's any questions um, uh, or concerns um, about the project or some of the expectations. And obviously at 6.59 p.m. is when the final deliverables will be due um, to the email provided. In terms of what those little deliverables are, um, we'll go through that in a little bit. And then we will have a optional just closing ceremony to wrap up 
um, our day and just say thank you to everybody for participating. Um, and then uh, we will um, announce the w winners and the prizes and the scores on the March 24th. I believe the time agreed upon was uh, 5 p.m. on uh, March 24th. Um, uh, so that's uh, what we'll be doing on March 24th. And also provided we have a backup um, Zoom link just in case um, um, all things, uh, that's just for worst case scenario, we will have a backup Zoom link provided. Um, in terms of the challenge itself, um, myself along with my colleagues here, we've put together what we like to call a major uh, public transit challenge. So this is, um, I guess, based on the Hamilton LRT project that is very much still in the early planning stages and um, works um, of the project. But if you are not familiar with the Hamilton LRT project, um, just a little bit of background information, it's about a 15, 16 kilometer light rail transit project proposed by the uh, government of Ontario in coordination with Metrolinx for a light rail transit system that runs from McMaster University all the way to East Hamilton and contains many stops along um, within downtown Hamilton near McMaster University, as you can see. And what we're trying to do is, I guess, um, get a, I guess, a different perspective on things in terms of the project scope of this um I guess challenge is to include a complete revitalization of both public and private infrastructure along with the transit route, including water, gas, and telecommunication lines, is what the project scope is um, entailing. But with your help, the team is required to provide the following addition to the project. So I guess what is required from you today is um, a proposal or a proposal of some design alternatives or feasible solutions to improve the HSR um, infrastructure um, that can provide easy connections to the Ham Hamilton LRT bike or pedestrian infrastructure. So I guess in a more si simplistic uh, point of view, uh, we're, we're asking you to maybe come up with some ideas of how um, you can in in integrate people with this infrastructure system and create um, create connections between the LRT and maybe some of the bike systems we have in Hamilton, such as Sobe, or connecting people from the LRT to um, maybe trails, walkways, how to make it easy access between connecting maybe between the LRT and um, maybe the HSR routes or, um, or provide um, di different solutions to how um, this will be integrated in terms of connecting to um, buildings and main points of attraction such as McMaster, um, maybe downtown Hamilton, and so forth. In terms of the deliverables required, it is um, it's very open ended in terms of there's no one right um, solution. In, in terms of I guess the challenge itself, there's many ide ideas that we can come up with in terms of how to making the LRT accessible from whether it be McMaster or any point of Hamilton. Um, whether that be related to um, creating bus uh, infrastructure, easy access ways and so forth. Um, but in this proposal um, that you guys come up with, what we're looking for in the report at least is maybe some background and the significance of the project. So just talking about what the LRT is about, what the object objectives or goals of your ideas are, or as well as the methodology and the outline of any sort of engineering methods required for your solution, as well as a summary of deliverables proposed to improve the infrastructure, followed by some co concluding remarks or recommendations. Um, we ask that it's kept within a six page limit, I think in terms of some more detailed um, requirements of the report, I'd say maybe, um, not maybe, but rather we'd ask that it be um, 12 point font, double spaced, um, and I don't think I'm missing anything else in terms of the proposal report. Um, but as well, we do ask for a two to three minute video, just you, just simply you on camera, summarizing the main components of your report or your ideas in a short video, just to encapsulate what your idea is. Um, if you have any visuals, any drawings, you can share that as well. Any sketches that you may have come up throughout the day, that's fine too. But 
Um, but just a short video as well. Um, this is just uh, the format of the report um, reiterated again. Um, some other considerations um, as well that we that you may consider when determining a feasibility or how to visualize your solutions. Um, can use a visual tool such as ArcGIS or QGIS. Today, we're we'll going through some basics of QGIS um, to maybe create some visualizations of your ideas or solutions. Um, I will say that um, ArcGIS um, is available on a educational um, licensing format um, or a trial format, which should be good enough for today. But QGIS is a uh, open access software, so um, it is free for anybody to use at any time. Um, so some other considerations we've also thought about maybe minimizing the amount of bus routes or the number um, of kilometers traveled by the buses or number of bus stops changing. So that could that could you that could be you guys coming up with maybe some different alignments or creating different bus routes that connect directly to the um, LRT or trying to find a way to make the connection between the LRT and other modes of um, transportation within the city more feasible. Um, maybe consider consider the fact of how, I guess, when, when you increase the number of stops within a network, that will obviously increase the travel time um, for people using this system. So it's also important to be mindful of if we are trying to create connections, how does that actually impact the commuter time? And as well, considering real-time conditions, such as the traffic within different parts of um, the network that you were considering, and then if your feasible, if your solution will impact the traffic conditions within the area. Um, in terms of the prize and rewards, um, Olivia, would you like to briefly uh, go over the? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, go over the. Um, uh, prize and rewards? Yeah, 100%. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so we have been graciously sponsored by both NEM and OSPE. Um, and with that, we decided that we were going to have cash prizes for this event. Um, so in first place, you will get $100 in cash. Second place, $75. And third place, $25. Um, the people who have... Um, one, uh, our little designathon challenge um, uh, will be um, told by March 24th at 5 p.m., as Jonathan uh, previously mentioned. Um, so good luck, work hard, have fun, um, and hopefully you'll see yourself on the podium. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Olivia. I just want to say, I just realized my my keyboard froze and I realized that it was stuck on this um, very first slide um, here about the introductory slide. I, I just want to say, um, I guess I'll just go over what I was talking about before because I did not realize my keyboard froze. Um, so this is just me talking about the deliverables, um, just to give you, just to reiterate what I was saying. So like I said, um, the technical part of the proposal or Components include a background or a project introduction or significance, the objectives of your idea, followed by um, the methodology or any engineering solutions required, methods required for your solution, I should say, as well as a summary of the, your deliverables or ideas proposed to improve the, the infrastructure, so as well as some concluding remarks and recommendations, followed by the six page limit that I reiterated, um, double space 12.4, and then I had spoken about the two to three um, minute video, just summarizing the main components. Um, in a short video, you can maybe present some visuals or sketches that you have, or if you have any other visuals, of course, you should obviously include it in your technical proposal report. Um, and this is, I think, the last thing I was discussing before Olivia had discussed the prizes, which is the other um, considerations. Um, so I had discussed about using um, ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, QG, QGIS was uh, the software that I iterated was more um, open-ended and um, uh, open open and free source down uh, software in the sense that you don't need to 
uh, use a trial version or anything like that compared to ArcGIS or use a student version ISSJ, which is why my tutorial at least will focus on uh, QGIS GIS for today. Um, it is very useful to maybe visualize your ideas or solutions um, using some nice labels and pinpoints and um, other visual features that I will briefly share. As well, I think I discussed uh, minimizing the number of routes, kilometers but travel by buses, and obviously the number of bus changes. So whether your solution maybe involves discussing how there's connect connectivity between other um, transportation modes such as bus or heavy rail such as go train um, or bikes and vehicles um, that should be considered as well as how does increasing the number of stops or adjusting the um, network route how does that um, impact the travel time for the for the uh, pedestrian uh, for the people using the system and as well consider re real time conditions um, including number of intersections and how your changes will impact uh, travel time um, and uh, congestion levels during different times of the day. Um, so I guess with that said, I will um, begin my QGIS tutorial. So I did include some uh, introductory um, ArcGIS slides, which I will go through um, after. But um, for now, we will start with um, the QGIS tutorial, um, which was kindly put together by one of our other executive members um, on our team, on our ITA McMaster team, um, Anastasia. Um, she is a PhD candidate um, who couldn't join us today, unfortunately, but she kindly helped me put this G QGIS tutorial together. Um, so if you would like to um, download QGIS, um, perhaps uh, Joseph, um, if you'd mind sharing the link in the chat, if anybody would like to get started by um, downloading the uh, QGIS uh, link. There is, um, it's very simple. Just when you get on the website, um, there'll be obviously a version for Windows or Mac um, available. Uh, depending on what platform you're using or OS you're using, you can simply click download. I think the latest version is 3.16, but there's also um, previous um, versions as well. Um, but obviously the newer version would be the ideal one. Um, but we can share that afterwards. So basically in QGIS, you're dealing with um, two types of, I guess, uh, data you're dealing with um, well in a in a nutshell you're dealing with spatial data but um, you're also dealing with um, two types of data that you can deal with vector data and um, raster data so I'll just briefly go go over the theory behind what these mean um, vector data simply put can be represented through points lines or polygons or represented in a matrix type of form um, so for example, the figure on the left here is it would be a matrix or a whole tabular column full with, um, I guess, column labels followed by the corresponding values. So it can be pre pre presented in tabular format. Um, it can also be presented in lines. So, so this figure in the middle here of this map with the whole bunch of bl blue line is just, I guess, uh, network construction of maybe some roadways or ul ulterior. Um, arterial um, roadways um, and these lines are put together using a whole matrix of X and Y coordinate pairs and um, as well you can have polygons so in the top right when we say polygons <clears throat> excuse me that can be represented I guess from the list of X and Y coordinate pairs and then it just compiles into um, dots um, dots or whatever sort of polygon feature you're using um, so I guess this is, uh, I guess a good example here of um, how you can use polygons to represent your data. So this is just a map of the Hamilton area and the different, um, I guess, regions of it, Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Stony Creek, etc., and how we can use GIS or QGIS to, I guess, um, visually um, show the different regions using very large polygon shapes. Um, for each mapped out area. 
Um, so in terms of how vector data works in a QGIS form, um, so I guess uh, with any any file types, we in QGIS, they use something called uh, shape files, which is just a collection of file types that provides all the information you need to import to QGIS. Um, I believe today we'll be working with the raster data, um, which I'll go over briefly, but um, some of the um, data sources that we have available that you guys can refer to use a mix of both. Um, but the process in terms of importing it and um, playing around with these is just the same. So in QGIS, you'll see that um, when you do import it, um, there's so many different file types as you can see on the very right there. Um, what those extensions mean um, is not too much to worry about right now, but um, you can see that um, when you have one layer of data, a vector data, it'll consist of maybe three separate files. And um, the, what that even means, I'll obviously go over, but um, the importance of knowing what shape files are is just how to import that into your software and how to play around with some of the features such as labels, colors, shapes, um, visual tools, and uh, creating, um, uh, creating uh, relevant um, outputs. Um, there's also, you can also, um, the importance of vector data as well, I guess um, you can uh, export your data um, into Google Earth as well to, I guess, create um, a visual sense um, with Google Earth and get an idea of how um, different mapping tools will will um, interact with different points of data. So in terms of how um, exporting data works is, is something I will um, share, share and present as well. Um, share and present as well in terms of what you can export as, whether it be as an image, uh, Google Earth file, and so forth. But for the sake of uh, today, I think uh, um, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll probably um, export my data as an image file just to show what it would look like uh, visually. Um, the other type of data that you can use, spatial data that is available in QGIS is um, raster data, which is essentially um, the more visual side of um, how spatial data is presented, and that is um, through pixels, or in other words, a grid of cells. So essentially what happens here is that every cell has a value, whether it be a color or a, unit, a measurement, and uh, raster data is really important if we're trying to create um, visualizations with respect to maybe heat maps, or um, heat maps are pretty important in transportation engineering to, um, to show maybe, um, maybe different levels of congestion. So for example, on Google Maps, raster data is very important. When you look on roadways and you're look, trying to see the current traffic conditions, and you'll see some roads have like a red line going through it, or some areas will have a yellow or green, obviously representing um, congestion, congestion conditions all the way to um, free flow congestion conditions. Um, uh, raster data is maybe important um, showing heat maps, so maybe, maybe different areas that have um, a good example is probably with the uh, Google Maps um, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they did use raster data to show different areas um, within the GTA that had higher COVID cases than another. Um, obviously, I think they use a scale similarly to red, yellow, green, where obviously green meaning a smaller number of cases, whereas the red um, zoned areas had a higher number of COVID cases. Unfortunately, uh, I did not have a picture reference uh, to share just because that has been taken down by uh, Google now. But um, you can see here as on the figure on the right how um, raster data is essentially represented by a cell of color or um, unit of measurement. And it can be stored as many um, file types, um, JPEG, PNG, or something called a georeference raster file, or in short, geotiff. Um, this is a good example of the heat map I was trying to discuss. This is with respect to maybe your elevation in different parts of a geographic area. Um, and obviously different colors respond to different um, um, units of measurement. In terms of spatial data, data is obviously everywhere. Um, there's so many open um, data sets and um, most of them are very spatial or geographic um, 
oriented. And there's obviously the government of Canada that has open data sources, the government of Ontario, um, probably maybe obviously for the sake of today's challenge, probably this link here, um, open, open data Hamilton provided from the city of Hamilton provides a lot of good data sets um, with respect to HSR, um, um, bike bike information that is a good um, reference for you to use. Um, as well, from McMaster University, if you are a McMaster student, um, the McMaster Library does provide um, some geospatial data. But um, oh, if you are not a McMaster student, um, it might not be feasible just because you require a McMaster login ID. But the rest are open source and available for anybody to use. Um, so I guess for the sake of McMaster students, if you already use this geospatial library, um, once you log in, obviously there's different um, data portals. So there's a one for scholarly, so I guess academic research, local data, so City of Hamilton, and then obviously open data portals, which will probably take you to municipal, pro provincial, and um, federal um, links. So these last two slides here is just and just to explain um, how, um, I guess, how, how spatial data is important in terms of telling a story or uses of it for analysis. So, for example, in this case here, um, from, from the city of hand, then they use GIS to tell a story about, I guess, the level of traffic stress and dominant routes. And I guess looking at different areas in Hamilton um, that use um, bike sharing methods. Um, uh, uh, we can definitely share this, but it just basically it shows the different, uh, I guess, traffic stress levels increasing from one to four, um, which is just uh, important to show, I guess, the significance when you have more traffic um, this and more traffic or more, I guess, infrastructure um, dedicated towards cars rather than bikes, obviously that reduces the amount of bike lanes available or bike infrastructure available. It can also be used, I guess, for storytelling or good means of communication. So this is just um, some other use cases. Um, a portrait of Hamilton, just, I guess, telling a story of Hamilton, respect to the history of its population, demographics. And um, it can also be used in an um, engineering perspective. So this other um, project here um, talks about the city of Burlington and their planning um, applications for like civic engagement workflows in terms of municipal projects going on within the city. Um, uh, so the sample session that I've prepared today um, it mainly deals with loading and raster data and vector vector layers. Um, the sample um, data that I'm using is provided um, from my colleague that I mentioned, Anastasia, as from a QGIS tutorial that she did. Um, um, basically, we're using a data set from um, actually the US today, more or less. Um, uh, more or less the state of uh, Alaska, we're just mapping out some of their, um, I guess, elevation layers and land types, as well as um, doing some lake labels and um, just creating a simple mapping output, just as a, a good, uh, straightforward example in the interest of time. Um, so with that said, I will start up uh, QGIS. So... So yeah, the yeah, the version I'm using is uh, three point two eight um, of which I believe is the newest uh, version of QGIS. Um, so uh, this is just my sample file. So this is just um, how the I guess initial um, space will look here. You'll have a section for your recent projects and all these tabs at the top for your project creating a new project. You can have a template. Um, you're going to just create new from scratch, your edits, your views, your layers, uh, tools, and all these different tools um, that can be imported. Um, so the sample, I guess, uh, tutorial that I'm using is based on 
um, uh, sample data provided from um, QGIS um, software itself. So essentially, um, here is in my downloads folder, just the sample data. So when you'd like to um, uh, like to import data, essentially what you're going to do is you would go to this icon here, um, which is called the Open Data Source Manager, is how you can load in sample files or sample data that you download, um, whether it be vector or raster data. And then from there, um, wherever you save the file on your computer, you can um, load it in. So I believe mine is in my, uh, sorry, my downloads uh, folder here. So under the sample data, um, the first thing um, that I'm going to do is um, load in my raster layer since we are dealing with raster data. So, um, so from the tutorial, um, uh, uh, the file that we're using here is called the uh, land cover. Um, so if you simply click, um, you can see it imports the map for you. Whether, it doesn't matter what file type you're dealing with, um, whether it be open source data from a municipal or provincial source, um, given that the data has already been kind of pre-made for you wherever you were downloading it from, one of the sources we provided, um, it will come out as something um, like this with all this information um, with it. Um, in the case of this example, um, the, the obviously the, the source that I'm using here is the state of Alaska. So obviously the map with all these different layers um, will come up. Um, and then what we're going to do is maybe create some labels, um, some legends to understand what each of these um, data sources mean. So the next thing I would have to do is um, import some of the other components here. So uh, I talked about adding some labels and some of the information about the lake data um, for uh, the state. So within that same project folder, um, Uh, so depending on how your data is um, sampled here, um, uh, you can see there's multiple folders for climate, CSV, GML, um, projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I would believe um, just in the case, in this use case, the, um, the, the data is a little bit complex in terms of there's so many folders usually you'll be dealing with one single folder. So you'd only have to um, add um, one set of data as you did here. Um, but just for the sake of this example, um, um, I will add in um, the lakes folder just because we want to show um, uh, multiple multiple layers. And then you can see, um, if you could see here, the lakes filter was added. Um, you can see if I turn the layer on and off on the lakes appear and disappear. And then you can see now what we're going to do is just play around with some of the layer properties. Well, how you do that is just you can double click on any layer. And you can see there's a lot to play around with here, all the way from labels to symbology to the source of the data um, and your information. I'll start with the source um, source part of things. That's probably the relevant, most relevant. Um, there are different coordinate um, systems. Um, this usually um, most data provided um, will already have an assigned coordinate reference system, but it's just um, good to, uh, good good to have in mind um, just in case you have any um, errors. Um, so sometimes if you if uh, if uh, if if you'd like to create a coordinate system, it's not necessary. So you can usually leave this blank. Um, but I feel like the more significant ones come after with the symbology, labels, and so forth. So for example, um, you can change the color here. So maybe 
for the sake of lake, maybe I'd want to use something like a blue and make a nice blue. Obviously, you click apply and you can see that the um, raster, uh, sorry, the lake's layer changes in terms of color, but you can use maybe even red, which is maybe not the best color. Um, you click apply, um, you can see um, that changes. There's also different project styles, so you can create some hatching here. These are some of the default ones. Um, you can also play around with the opacity, so the transparency. You can see when you do that, it becomes a more faint orange. Um, you can also see there's all these different patterns. If I do a hatching, you can see it becomes more of a hashed black format. Um, here. So that just the symbology is pretty important in terms of creating a, um, I guess, a visual sense. Um, depending on a number of layers you have, allows you to create different colors and symbologies based on what um, you are dealing with. It's just this, in the sake of this tutorial, um, I'll just keep it blue for now. Um, there's also labels. So I think that's the next part I'll cover, um, which would be important. So usually when you want to create a label, um, you can simply click the drop down and um, there's something called single labels, rule-based labeling, and blocking. Um, rule-based is if you have, I guess, multiple complex layers and you're dealing with maybe some more um, complex uh, mapping, you would need rule-based labeling. But the, for, for the sake of time, I think single labels would be the most relevant. So you can see here. Um, so obviously your data, um, when you import it, will obviously have already filled um, I guess labels are already attributed to it. So the labels meaning, I guess, um, maybe name, the value associated with it. The values are usually um, the coordinates of the location of, um, in this case, with the lakes there, your, I guess, your, your value labels here are attributed to the, I guess, coordinates of the lake and as well the size of the lake itself. But obviously, there will obviously be something called a names layer or an ID layer, which is just the name of the um, uh, layer itself. Um, so within the single labels layer, you can adjust so many things such as the text, the formatting, um, the buffer, which is just another fancy way of saying shadow, uh, mask, it's also a different type of shadowing and you can have um, shadowing or molding, I should say, and there's all these um, different placements and background effects that we can use. And then you can see here with the text layer, you can obviously adjust the font, the style, the size, the color. And if you click apply, you can see um, the text does show up here, um, but obviously it's not the most visually appealing, um, appealing um, thing to look at. It's very hard to see in most of the cases. So what you can do is go to maybe uh, buffer, as, as I was saying, you can, you can, yes, use the uh, buffer or you can use, uh, sorry, the thing I was looking for disappeared on. Um, you can use the buffer or the mask. But before I do that, um, I will show another tool that you can use um, in terms, of, I guess, decorating. So uh, if you go to view, the view tab is probably um, the next relevant thing here. You can look at your map view, how to pan, how to zoom in and out. Um, but there is also a tool here called decorations, which I guess is a nice way to create some labelings. You can see you create, you can create a north arrow, add an image, a scale bar, or create a grid system if you want to show this in terms of a grid. But first thing I'll show you is the scale bar. And um, so the scale scale bar is just um, when they say decorations, we don't really mean decorations, but it's just adding some of the more geographic tools such as a scale for the scale for the actual map, maybe some coordinate system um, in one of the corners or um, adding a legend. So the purpose of the scale bar, um, you can do things such as um, what type of, I guess, bar is going to be. 
the font, the size of the bar, um, and so forth. So obviously you can play around with the colors. Most of these other settings are pretty um, default. If you click apply, you can see in the top right corner or top left corner, you, you'll always have a scale bar in terms of, um, depending on if you zoom in and out, how big is um, the distance. So obviously this distance here would be 3000 kilometers. And as we zoom in, it will change. Um, given that your data will all obviously be geo-referenced and have a geo-reference to it, um, uh, this will change automatically with your data um, as it is doing here. Um, but going back to the lakes layer, um, the thing that I was trying to show was actually the buffer, um, buffer in this case, an outline. So this just simply, like I was saying, improves the readability of your um, data. Um, so simply you can do buffer or mask, you can enable either one. So for example, if you simply click on text buffer, um, you just check mark that and that activates it. You can set a color for it. For now, I'll just select this, I guess, white um, or a faint gray. Um, uh, if you click apply, you can see it creates a nice buffer or I guess a text outline. That way you can actually see what the text is saying um, instead of having a squint and kind of read what you're looking for. You can see um, the text does adjust as we zoom in and out to create more of a readability. That's more of an automatic thing um, that does happen within QGIS depending on how zoomed in or zoomed out you are. Uh, so yeah, that, 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 those are, I guess, yeah, how you can import layers and play around with the layer, even with um, the land color, uh, the actual, I guess, land tools. Um, we can uh, play around with some of the colors here, like I was saying, um, transparency, the source of the data. Um, you can also add layers to it, such as maybe um, you can draw in your own shapes or you can draw in your own shapes, create a layer, um, create a layer where you can add in more layers based on your data. Um, or you can add in simply labels here. You can add pins, obviously, and create your own labels um, and so forth. But in order to do that, the first thing you have to do is simply create a new layer. And then upon this new layer is when you can add some of the more complex features. Uh, not necessarily complex, but some of these more, um, I guess, customizable features. Um, so, so in that case, it's fairly um, straightforward. Um, I guess the the uh, the other thing I would like to show as well is um, how you go about maybe exporting this. Um, so simply put, going to project. Obviously, you can see this directly in the import export layer. You can see this. Um, you can import as an image, um, PDF, and so forth. Um, so if you go to image, it will just take the, I guess, what's on the screen right now. You can adjust um, the coordinates um, or the exporting um, size as you like. You can adjust the scale, the resolution, um, the output height, width. Um, uh, you can um, select what's included in terms of the active decorations, annotations, um, and so forth. And if you click save, I will just save to my desktop. Um, in this case, I'll save as a PNG. And then if we go to the desktop, um, you can see it exports exactly what was in this screen there, which I think is a perfect, um, perfect uh, size um, in terms of uh, what I was looking for. Like I said, we can adjust the exporting scale as we wish. Um, as we wish and um, you can, um, based on if you're trying to look more zoomed in on a particular section or particular area of the map, you can do so. Um, there is also, so so that, that kind of entails some of the basics of uh, QGIS and like I said, there is also um, Arc ArcGIS where uh, 
Um, that just requires a free trial um, download, which uh, just because it is not as open source as QGIS. Um, with ArcGIS, um, it is very similar in terms of how you import and play around with layers and add features to it. Um, some of the open um, data sources provided um, that will provide going forward. Um, obviously, you'll see some of them use um, ArcGIS. That's just because it comes from a, it's coming from a, I guess, a, I guess a company source. So obviously, they do have access to GIS. But using QGIS is not a problem because it has the similar uh, functionality. With with that said, I think that covered everything I wanted to say at least about um, the basics of QGIS. Um, unless anybody had any questions, comments, or concerns, um, we're obviously here to answer any questions, whether it be how to download, how to make um, any adjustments, um, how to make any adjustments. But um, I think for, this, for the sake uh, of this challenge, and obviously, um, the deadline is 6.59. We're not expecting any sort of crazy, crazy um, complex uh, mapping, visualization, but um, if you'd like to include um, um, some visual tools, um, QGIS would be a great place to start, or ArcGIS um, as well. Or if you feel comfortable using ArcGIS, that's fine too. Um, obviously, um, it would take quite a bit of time to go through ArcGIS as well, um, but I we I do have some sample tutorials we can provide for um, ArcGIS as well, if anybody would like an introductory to that as well. But it does just slightly take a little bit more time. Um, but in terms of uh, that, in terms of that, that is um, all for me about QGIS. Um, if there's uh, no questions for now, um, I think that is all for me. And um, just want to say yeah, thank you for listening. And um, thank you for listening. And obviously, we're here to support you guys and answer any questions, comments, whether it be about the actual design deliver deliverables, requirements. Um, and obviously, throughout the day, if there's any questions that come up, we'll be available as well. Um, so this is just our um, McMaster email and our handle um, ITMAC on Instagram, or you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, you won't find us on Twitter, but um, um, or TikTok, um, but um, definitely LinkedIn and uh, Instagram. Um, you'll definitely find us. And um, uh, and I and obviously thank you. I guess to them as well for allowing us to host this event. And these next few slides just contain some of their um, uh, partners. So the lead partner obviously being um, Humber. And then there's also the list of their champion partners here, um, followed by ally partners and um, advocate partners. Um, and yeah, thank you uh, once again for listening to me. Um, I know there's a lot of information dumped there. Um, in that last in the past half half an hour or so but um, like i said we're all here to support anybody who has any questions or concerns and um that is it from me uh well thank you again so much jonathan for that excellent uh qgis tutorial um and once again thank you to all of the sponsors of national engineering month uh, if you don't mind, could we just go through those last four slides one more time uh, they, you know, are really the ones responsible for providing us funding to make this event happen. Um, and just to go over a few more administrative things about the rest of today, um, it is a design challenge. So we were, we would like to see everyone submit their uh, proposal document and video by 7 p.m. today, essentially because we do not want to ask anyone here to stay up till midnight or stay up all weekend trying to get this done. More so, we want it to be a chance to create a really good idea about solving the problem of integrating the HSR with the LRT in Hamilton and you know getting your hands a little dirty with QGIS or any other GIS software, uh, more so than spending hours and hours 
on uh, writing the report. That being said, if you have obligations during the day today and would still like to participate, um, that deadline is, of course, flexible. Just please email us um, at itemacmcmaster.ca. Again, we'll only be releasing the, uh, res the scoring results and the first, second, and third place finishes by this coming Friday. So if you are unable to complete uh, the design challenge by 7 p.m. today, or you're not satisfied with what you have, please reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to accommodate you. Um, but again, at 7.30 today, um, hopefully in this Zoom call, otherwise in the backup one, uh, we'll be having a short closing ceremony just to wrap up the day and provide some closure to the event. Uh, that's optional if you do want to attend that. I know it's not scheduled in the original registration. Um, and yes, we will be able to uh, share these slides. We'll provide the link um, in the proposal document. Um, and I will just share that document as well uh, in the chat again. If you have any troubles accessing that at all, please do let us know now so we can fix that. But otherwise, I think that's all the administrative stuff out of the way. Um, Olivia, though, our VP Media, always remembering her role, uh, would love <laughs> would love a group photo if you would be willing. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, I'll let her take that away. To everyone in the meeting, thank you so much for being here. Um, I do want to get a group photo, but obviously that is 100% optional. Um, if you'd like to turn your camera on, please do so now. I'll give everyone a bit of time to do that. Um, and then I'll be taking a screenshot of the Zoom meeting um, so that we can see everyone's beautiful shining faces. Um, these photos uh, would be posted on our Instagram, um, our LinkedIn. Uh, so if you're not comfortable with that, you don't have to turn on your camera. Um, but if you are comfortable with that, please turn on your camera so that we can see you guys. Oh, and sorry, Jonathan, if you don't mind, would you be able to stop sharing your screen? Whoops, sorry, sorry. I'll just wait a few more seconds. Hope you guys enjoyed the event. And obviously we've got a whole day worth of designing to do, so that's so exciting. Okay, I'm going to take the photo in three, two, one. Okay, thank you guys so much.